Hello everyone and welcome to this podcast from The Light Review and I am overjoyed to have Ruth Kelly Waskett joining us today, uh, latest, newest president of the SLL. Ruth, hello, how are you? Hi John, uh, I'm very well, a little bit warm like everyone at the moment. Um, I, but, isn't yeah, that great? Oh, thank you, yeah. it is, it's a good thing. Yeah. I've done some of these podcasts almost wearing a bobble hat. Yeah, we... <laughs> yeah. So we've gone from one extreme to the other. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, is, is, is life returning to anything like normal yet? No, it definitely isn't. And, you know, I've kind of given up on that. I, I've, I've accepted that it's not going to go back to anything. You know, it's not going to go back to how it was. Maybe some things are. Um, but um, I mean, just from, my, you know, in my sort of firm Horley we haven't returned to our London office uh, there are some people working from the office but those people are kind of in particular situations where they that that's what they needed to do and um, the majority of the workforce are still working remotely and then in other offices around the country there are people more people going in so mm -hmm. it's probably a bit more normal for for people in say Bristol or um, you know Birmingham than it is in London London has to be different, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it it's never been anything else. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 I mean, how has how has that worked? Uh, does does the does the communication flow is that is that different to, to what we've been used to as it's settled into a into into a better process? I mean, we were talking earlier before we started the recording how punctuality has yes. uh, has, has really come to the fore when when we're doing these kind of meetings. So have you, yeah. have you noticed any qualitative difference in the way that the work's being done? Yeah, I have. Um, I think we've all surprised ourselves, and I'm sure people in across the board in, in lots of practices have seen this. I think we've absolutely surprised ourselves at how well we've been able to still deliver projects, despite the fact that we're not in a room together. And, you know, most of us love to doodle, don't we? It, that's one of the things I miss is the doodling and the this is what I mean, conversation. And I really miss that. And I like I have a whiteboard app on my machine and all that kind of thing. But I find I think we've just found other ways of getting our messages across. And in some ways, we've had to tune in a lot more to what each other are trying to say. We've had to maybe, you know, perhaps one side effect of the pandemic is that we've actually had to be more um, focused on looking for little signals from people. You know, we oh. things things don't get through, don't they? Not on on um, video calls. Things we don't see all the details in people's faces, and there is sometimes a lag and things like that that kind of get in the way. But I think some of us maybe have actually had to sharpen our senses, you know, to yes. to really read each other. And um, and then the other thing that's happened to us, which might be not necessarily um, generic, is that we have lighting people in different offices and before the pandemic, you know, we, we rarely all got together. And whereas now we get together every Monday. So it's, it's, that's been really good, really good. Um, and we're going to keep going with that. So, yeah. because, you know, we have one or two people who are kind of lone rangers in, in the office as in lighting, mm -hmm. lighting lone rangers. So, you know, I think it's been great for them to be able to, you know, jo join with the team more, you know, on yeah. a regular basis. One of the things that I, I found was that because because we can't physically get out and, and share a space, that um, friends around the world who, uh, you know, the, la the, the last last exhibition and conference I was at was, was um, in, in Rotterdam um, in 2019. And I remember sort of sitting there around a table with, um, Martin Clarsen from Singapore and, and Jim Benya from out of uh, out California and various other people. And at the end of that, it was great. Lovely to see you all, guys. See you at the next one. Yeah. But now you don't do that. You just go, are you up for a Zoom call? Yeah, yeah. So it, they, they might really well just good. be around the corner now. Yes, yeah. And, 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 and opening up that way has been quite, I, for me, has been, has been quite an exciting thing. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think 
from, you know, on a personal level, I have friends that live in different parts of the world that I've been able to do that with. It's like, why am I waiting? Why don't we just do a Zoom call? You know, I don't need to wait until next time you're in Dublin and I'm in Dublin and any of that stuff anymore. So that's been really good. And from a lighting point of view, yeah, I was I was at Rotterdam too. And that was the last thing I was at before all this. Um, and um, yeah, that a lot of the some say, for example, the women in lighting um, movement, mm. that's very international. And, you know, I think a lot of the success there has been because we're able to have events that involve people all over the world. You know, um, we don't need to wait until we all get together at a conference to talk about something. Yeah. So that's it, really on, good. On a, on a domestic front, my, my, my partner has, has got involved in a, in a local uh, public speaking uh, group. Uh, it's something that she does. She, you know, she presents workshops of her, of her textile work. And, wow. uh, and <laughs> under normal circumstances, that's the meeting that would happen in, in Dorchester. And it would be people from Dorchester and Sherbourne and Weymouth and all the rest. But since it's been online, they have people popping in from Texas. Brilliant. And, and from India. Yeah, you know, it's, it's because it's, it, that little meeting has become a global uh, event for, for people who look forward and, and they come back. And you go, do, do, and do we ever want to go, do we ever want to get back to the idea that you don't talk to those people? Yeah. I mean, so it, wherever our new really normal sits, it's going yeah. to be an interesting one. It is. So how about, how are you factoring in the SLL work on top of all of this? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I'm taking it as it comes, you know, and I think <laughs> um, so far so good, but um there is always a lull in the summer with SLL activity. Uh, I think that's probably common among professional institutions. There's a kind of a summer recess. So, um, you know, that's fortunate. I, I'm sure they've designed it that way. You, you start as president in May and then there's a kind of a, you know, now you can breathe. <laughs> and then, yeah. So, you know, maybe that will happen. Um, so, yeah, so far so good. And I mean, you know, at, my my colleagues at Horley, you know, my my superiors are very supportive. Thank goodness, um, I wouldn't be doing this otherwise. And and you know, so they they they're kind of prepared to. They know that I'm going to be otherwise engaged yeah. um, a lot of the time, and that's and that's good. So as long as I can still manage things, um, which you know, thanks to the great team, I can I can I can rely on them. So um, mm. you know, we should be able to we should be able to manage. Yeah, I did wonder about that because I, I think looking at, at, at sort of past presidents, you know, uh, Bob, um, essentially self-employed guy, yeah. Uh, yeah. when Liz was there, self-employed, but here you are, you're part of a big team. And I wondered to what extent, it's almost like it's, it's half a sabbatical. Yeah, yeah, you could look at it that way. And I, uh, you know, I mean, I think you do have to kind of apportion your time in some way because it's not fair on you or on the firm if you don't do that. And I think it's important that mm. everyone goes into it with the right expectations. And like you, I kind of went through previous presidents and kind of self-employed, self, -employed, self Acad academia and I was like okay but then you know Jeff Shaw he he's Arab you know yeah. and, and Jeff and I had a coffee when I agreed to do this and I said you know is this doable because the other thing the other part of this I've got to be honest you know I'm a parent as well and Jeff is also a parent and I thought that was why he he was particularly you know an important person for me to to talk to because I I really wanted to know is this doable um, you know, when you've got all these different um, things going on. And, you know, mm. he, he convinced me that it is. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, and Jeff. <laughs> thanks, 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 Jeff. Um, and, and, and Jeff is one of the new guys, of course, uh, because one of the things that, that um, it in, inspired me with, with you in your uh, inauguration uh, acceptance speech, whatever it was that you have to do there, was the um, sort of shining that light on the membership and, yeah. and, 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 and saying that, you know, at the moment, we, the SLL is, is very much male dominated. But if you look to see who's coming through, uh, it's a very different picture. But, you know, here I am, an old man. You know, I am, I can't, you know, I can't ignore that. And we, we recognise that so much of this kind of work is traditionally done by men who don't traditionally 
do the do the, the shopping and the cooking and the childcare. Um, and so here we are in, in with you know you you are inheriting the, the, this particular mantle, and it's a male mantle. And I wonder. Here's the thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, if we take, I think, I think that most professional organisations, such as the SLL, follow a male pattern. Yeah. You know, what do men do when they when they arrive somewhere? They usually find that they usually ask. So, so which road did you take? Did you take the A three hundred three? Did you come up the M three? What, what was? Yeah. You know, what's that all about? And I think it's the same kind of mentality that writes lighting codes. I think it's a, it's a need to pigeonhole and and to quantify and to put things into boxes. And I think that's what men do. So what intrigues me is what an SLL managed, run, and I use the word politely, dominated, as in the majority, by women. And what would, what could an SLL lighting guide look like if it wasn't produced by 23 men and one woman when it might be 23 women and one man and i just yeah. want you that if, if, if you've actually sort of dreamt any of that you say oh i wonder what would happen if we could actually get a proper women's approach rather than the patriarchy the male dominance of this is the this is the this is the right way to do it why because it's the way we've always done it because we were approaching a time when we need to question those those things and say maybe there's a different way of doing this sort of stuff. What do you think? Really? Yeah. So there's loads in there. So I let know. me let me tease that apart a bit. <laughs> so I think one of the things that I would say is it's not about a female approach or a male approach. It's definitely about a fresh approach. So there is a need to bring in a different mindset, and that involves making sure that we've got a representation of gender, which is my primary thing, but also uh, ethnicity, social background and neurodiversity. So, you know, all of those things are important in making the outcome the best thing that it can be that 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 might actually appeal and encourage engagement from a much wider audience. And that's definitely I agree. You know, that's what we that's what we need to do. And I think then the other part of this is that um, SLL has its roots in science. So yeah. um, I looked back at the history of SLL recently, uh, you know, in part of my, just, just for my own understanding really of how it's evolved to where it is now. And it started out as the Illuminating Engineering Society, which, you know, we have our counterpart in North America. And then it changed uh, to become the Society of Light and Lighting in the year 2000. So that's quite recent. And the Illuminating Engineering Society became part of CIBSE in 1978. Uh, I only remember all these, you know, yeah, two <laughs> years after I was born. So that's easy to remember. Um, and, you know, and I think that there, we need to recognize that that's the roots of the organization. And when, when lighting first started as, you know, anyone who's looked who's looked back understands this it was about numbers it was about how many how what what looks level do we need in order to do this you know can we read a newspaper in this level of yeah and, and of course it was all you know an old man with a, in a with a pipe reading the financial times or whatever it was so you know can we read a newspaper can can a factory man work in his factory at this illuminance level yes or no tick 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 so, you know, that's where lighting started. And that is not, obviously, that's not where it is, or it's certainly not where we want it to be today. It's, it's a multidiscipline uh, science. It, it involves art and science. It, it, it involves, you know, as I said in my address, it, we are made up of people with backgrounds in create, creative backgrounds and scientific backgrounds, and that's our strength. And I definitely want to see SLL publications becoming more holistic so that we can really recognize the visual side of what we do. Um, part of it, there's some mechanics behind this that are a little bit banal that I don't want to bore everyone with about how... Go on, bore the, away, Ruth, uh, don't worry the, about it. The typesetting, you know, that we use, um, the, the, the design of the documents, 
they're a little bit constraining and we're looking at that. So, you know, we're, we're currently underway. We're, we're looking at how we can make the document format just a bit more enticing. And, you know, we need that because people don't, certainly we don't really expect anyone to read a guide cover to cover but it does make it just a lot more pleasurable you know if, if you're if it's a document that you want to look at and you want to keep reading um, and we don't want it to be all about tables and numbers I think unfortunately there is a side to SLL the, the, which is which we can't deny, which is that you know we do provide guidance where where the sort of foremost source of guidance in the lighting industry, and we have to do that in a way that you know befits the seriousness of what we're doing. Yeah, so there is that element, and we can't lose that. But we need to. We also need to bring in, uh, for example, some of our documents just maybe they, they jump in straight into, you know, some quite hard stuff without any kind of preamble about why we want to do that. So that's something that, you know, for example, that we're yeah. looking at. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I did, I did uh, blimey, uh, if, we, if we're going to go back, you know, I, 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 I was a quali I think I had my papers, I was a qualified illumination engineer by 1974. <sighs> And again, numbers, number crunching, it's, it was all engineering. I didn't really consider myself a designer, probably, I think, until the early 80s. Um, and what happened is that someone, I, 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 I don't know, I was working for a manufacturer. And, and I, I took, I went back to a, a, an interior designer and said, I've got an idea for you. And, and I explained it. I can't remember what it was now. And they said, where did that come from? And I thought, I've no idea. I think it came out of my head. I think I've just become a designer. Because yeah. before then, it's case, you need 300 looks on this, you need 500 looks over there, you need 700 looks over there, and this is how we'll do it. Yeah. And, and the idea of, 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 of saying, you know, the, the art and the science of light, and we, are, we have been hamstrung by numbers, sadly. Yeah. And it would be great to, to have, have documentation that I could whip out and show to a client and go, look at this. And they get it straight away without having to read two or three pages of stuff to explain to them why it, this is a creative process. Yes. Yeah. So I, 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 I best of luck with that. I think that would be, be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And of course, some of, the, some of the subject matter that we are now talking about does not lend itself to numbers. Um, dare I talk about circadian lighting or do we even mention human centric or have we got another term for that? Health and well-being will do nicely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tend to avoid human centric like the play, you know, like most like most light, lighting people. Um, yeah, I, I, I think circadian lighting is is fine i'm i'm comfortable we with can that. live with that can't we yeah we can I, I, hey, i've reached a stage now where i'm having to talk about light bulbs again <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't, sometimes I don't you just care. have to yeah <laughs> when i'm when i'm talking to friends sometimes i i have to but there's always a little you probably find this you kind of go light bulbs yeah, yeah, you kind of have to bring yourself to say like it catching the throat like as cho it comes choking in. on it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But what we, the thing that we know about mm -hmm. circadian lighting, health and well-being, is that um, none of us trust the numbers. Is that is that correct? I I didn't. Is that I correct? haven't perceived. I don't, maybe you do. Yeah. No. No. I mean, um, I, it's interesting that that's your perception as well. Um, we have these numbers now, don't we, from the um, the Manchester Group, two hundred and fifty melanopic EDI and so on. And I guess, do you think? You're supposed to be asking me the question, but I'm interested to, to hear what you think, because I'm, do, you, do you think that people feel that that needs to be tested in real life to see what that actually looks like? I think that's the problem. I, I'll, I'll go back to what Andrew Bissell said when we first started talking about this whole topic. And he said, the only way we can make this work is when we've got 24 hour control of everybody's environment, which sounds like the International Space Station. And, and we know that they've been working on it in the International Space Station. So, 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 so you know, no doubt data can come out of it, but you know, and into that you've got to factor a zero gravity environment, which might have something to say about itself. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think we do need to prove hard numbers because otherwise, why is that hard? What is that hard number doing there? 
and that the humanity humanity yes. will out you know humanity will just get in the way of itself and sometimes it's you know the, the thing that the the, the current you know, I, you know i've been talking a lot to shelly james i know you've been talking yes. to shelly james at, at, at the age of life and you and i did you want to go and do something go outside yeah you yeah, want to feel better yeah. go and stand in the sunshine yeah you know? that, that, that's it yeah a lot of this is behavioral you know a lot of it is behavioral and we cannot obviously yeah we can't control apart from the very unusual scenario of the international space station we're not going to be able to dictate that what people receive but i keep drawing parallels with diet uh, you know i don't know why but I, my, my mind keeps going back to food and nutrition and thinking about how you know we don't force people to eat a particular diet we just give information to them so that they mm. can make healthy choices or they can just eat burgers all day you know it's up to them it's whatever you you know you, as long as you know that that's healthier than that you know it's up to you and and with lighting that's all we can really do as well with for people is to say this environment is healthier or if you go outside more that will be healthier you know, and I mean, that that kind of trumps everything, really, doesn't it? Because if we're designing a building and that building is somewhere that people have to travel to get to, then as long as they've exposed themselves to daylight on the way, a lot of the time that will have done its job. Yeah. Um, that will have gone a long way towards making them healthier than if they commuted in the dark and then yeah. sat in a dark room. I think that's exactly right. And, and I, I think then our our role in i mean okay i know that you know, you're you're seriously into daylighting so you're, you're into the, the the built form uh but once we have to turn the lights on and we've got control over that it's at that point that yes we we can have our engagement yes but our enga our, our engagement is in the context of a, 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 so a, a, the advice that runs from the time you get up in the morning to the time you get up the next morning and yes. things that you might like to think about doing and things that you might like to stop doing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where we have to, that's where I think we have to step up because as lighting sort of people, as lighting experts, we need to be able to say to a client, how can we design lighting so that when it, when people, so, you know, let's, let's paint a utopian picture where we have a building and the daylight is amazing. Um, you're still going to have to switch the lights on at some point when the sun goes down, for example. What is it about that lighting that we can do just to make it support people's health more? Yeah. And, you know, there and there are things we can do and that's where we need. So we've been focusing a lot. And I mean, I've fallen into the trap just now by saying 250 MEDI. That's daytime. What about what happens in the evening? So we've got this maximum of 10 now that, that they've recommended and what what do we do about that does that mean that the sources that we that we specify need to have capability to turn all the blue off and just you know deliver the warm end of the spectrum you know how, how do we how do we handle that um yeah. and in residential i find it particularly interesting for for homes because you know just just ordinary people making choices about lighting in their homes and how how do they make those choices? You know, it's kind of bewildering for them. It has been since the advent of LED, hasn't it? Where, of course it has. you know, you're, yeah. you're looking at lumen uh, output instead of wattage and, you know, people are still getting to grips with that. So um, it's, it's always surprising to me how much we can help, even with just small, sometimes maybe we're, we're falling into the trap as an industry of talking to ourselves and thinking we need to have this all worked out before we tell everyone about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, <laughs> people left to their own devices and, and, and with, with the, with the, with the appropriate hardware, which has not been easy with led because we've lost some of the natural hardware. I think we, I think we naturally drift into a suitable lit environment in our own homes. The problem is we don't drift into suitable behavioural patterns in our homes. So when we say maybe not be a good idea to take your phone to bed, uh, you might like not to look at the news after 10 o'clock at night, um, not because of the light that's coming from the screen, but because of what it is that you're reading or what it is that you're looking at. This is possibly this is about sleep patterns, isn't it? I mean, this, this yeah. is ultimately it what they're saying that you know, we, we are we are we are impoverished in terms of our sleep quality 
Yes. So if we're going to do anything, can we make sure that we get in that back on board? Yes, and, it, and, and I always find this tricky because we do then, we're straying into all kinds of other areas that aren't lighting, like what people want to watch and what devices they want to look at, you know, late in the evening. And yeah, it's, it's tricky, you know, because I found myself saying things like, uh, you know, try to sleep in an area that's dark and and you know the reality of it is that a lot of people can't or they you know they, they there's street lighting that is going to intrude mm. into their room and, and so on so yeah I think it's very tricky but but the the fact is yeah there's a big there's a big problem with sleep in the developed world and we've got to look at the role that lighting plays in that and it's huge so you yeah. know although there are all these other there, there are um probably lots of other contributing factors to the sleep problem like obesity and um uh, technology like the the encroaching what's the right word encroachment i like it i like encroaching we can, we encroaching can <laughs> let's just make up a word the, yeah the encroachment of um technology on our lives you know and that's that's meant that there's just so much more stuff for us to take in all the time but you yeah. know we, we we do it i do it myself so it's hard to switch off in the evening so i think um yeah, it, we stray into all these other areas, don't we? But I just want us as lighting people to take to take our part, you know, to look to look at our part in that and our role in that yes, yeah. and to try and help how we can. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I'm in, in the situation where I've lived down in the, in, in the southwest uh, for the last 20 years where you learn that if you um, if you want to do any kind of work at all down here, you will do residential work because it's the only work that's, that's, that's available to you. But it puts you in front of people. It puts you in front of those people who say, can you help me? Yes. And that's it. So, so I end up doing counselling sessions on how to live your life. <laughs> yeah. You thought you were just lighting engaging designer, a lighting slash designer. Slash You've got coach. a psychotherapist at the same life time. Life coach, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Light it's coach. a conversation. That, where else do you get it? It's not on the telly. Yes. You can read, yes. About it. I read about it sometimes, you know, once in a blue moon in, in, a, in a weekend supplement or something but generally it's when we are sitting down and saying so what do you what what happens in this room explain this room to me yeah and at that point you can start is that we're not talking about lighting you believe me we're talking about lighting yes absolutely it, i think that's really interesting and i envy that you have that that direct um i know it can i know it's a double-edged edge sword but um I, I really you know the fact that you have that one-to-one -one contact with the people who are going to live with the lighting that you're you know unlike other developments where you're talking to the person who's developing the building and then yeah. it's going to walk away or whatever it is so yeah I think that's really interesting and my my only experience of that really is just friends who come to me for advice and yeah and you get those interesting mixtures where people are where I, I, I hear myself telling them what I think is the right thing for their room. And then, and then they say, but I like to use my sewing machine over here at night. And, you know, I think that's really, I think they're the kind of challenges that are really interesting because they need enough light to be able to see what they're doing, but we don't want to be giving them so much light that it's going to keep them awake all night. So there's those kinds of, people will not make those choices by themselves because they won't know that that's the outcome. Yeah. of that decision it probably and helps the, product, the products that are out there are not helping them either no 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 it, it probably helps to be to become a feng shui consultant as well yes yeah, yeah i think that's a good combo yeah. okay right I'll, yeah. I'll run some workshops on that because yeah. i am i can yeah. do good <laughs> do that. um as right as we as, right just straying into in, in, into that world of the woo woo um i was fascinated that you mentioned new grange uh, in 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 your talk in your in in your acceptance speech because what what a structure absolutely fantastic um let's assume that that, that everyone who's, who's who's now tuning into this this fantastic conversation unfortunately missed that talk explain to us why you mentioned new grange in that talk so new grange because it's I mean it's close to my heart but it does embody something which is really important um, and, and fundamentally what it is is it's the relationship of the building with the natural world uh, but but in this case light in particular and that's why it's so important so I think um, it's also got that it, it's got that amazing 
when you go there, you know, and, and you visit you, I think I said in my address that you get to walk into the inner chamber and they simulate what happens on the winter solstice when the sun rises. Um, I have to say they do a pretty good job and I haven't dug into it to find out what technology they use. It's probably something quite basic, but it works fine. Um, you get you get this profound, you know, it's the profound profundity of the experience. So it's that thing where it's not just that it's getting brighter. It's like that's the very skin deep part of it. So the skin deep is, yes, the light level increases. And then what's happening apart from that is that you're feeling a sense of you're overcome by how it transforms from completely dark to filled with light over a nice period. So it doesn't happen suddenly. Um, and it reveals all the textures and there's lots of texture inside because it's made of stone and there's all these carvings. Um, there's also the warmth, which I think must be hugely psychological because when they simulate it, you know, it might be November and it might be lash and rain outside, but, but somehow you feel this warmth, you know, in the chamber as it becomes brighter. There, there is also a huge sense of anticipation because the light creeps along the passageway. So it is like it's coming, it's coming. And then, you know, it fills up. So it's, yeah, that, that's why, that's one of the reasons why I talked about it, because I think it captures something about the, all the, the layers of lighting, of experience of light. The thing, one of the things about Newgrange that people probably don't, well, I'm hoping that we can get some pictures from the new Grange people so that we can just sort of put overlap the, the conversation so that people can see what we're talking about but new Grange is older than Stonehenge by some yes. way I think yes yeah by several thousand years which is really hard to get your head around yeah um, um uh, yeah there are there are other examples of um burial mounds uh, the style of of monument there are other examples around the british isles but that mm. one has this particular relationship with this uh, solar geometry that that is unique yeah, yeah. i know I, I think it's, it's fascinating and I, you know, I've, I've studied earth energies and, and all of those sort of things and the relationship of, of, with the sun and the moon and us and so and so on and a new grange is, is is such a, a fantastic example because it's still in one piece yes yeah of what that light meant to those people i mean yeah we call it we call it a, a barrow grave don't we but yes yeah but the, you know the the feeling for a long time is that these things were much more important than that yeah there yes. might be some bodies in there but actually there was there was something much much bigger going on and it was all about light and us yes i agree i think because it's so old you know, a lot of what we know about it is based on speculation. I mean, some of the people who have speculated are extremely knowledgeable, but nonetheless, they weren't there. None of us were there. So we'd, we'll never really know how those how that community used that structure. But I do think it's beautiful, the, the, the symbolism of light and the kind of they were farmers, I think, you know, as far as we know. So mm -hmm. there is definitely a I think a link and, and I think it's widely thought that there's a link between that that symbolism of light and the fertility of the land you know and how important that was to them yeah yeah it's, it's absolutely fascinating uh Ruth you, I've, I've taken more of your time than I was in, in, intending to uh and I, I'm, I'm sure you've got other calls that you need to do so uh thank you ever so much for your time today it's great let's see if we can do this again sometime and uh maybe halfway through the year so we can see how the how the presidency is progressing. Yeah, that would be great, John. It's been a real pleasure to talk we'll to you. We'll put it in the thank diary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ruth, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone um, for, for, for staying with us for this time. And um, if you see Ruth out there, give her a shout, give her a wave, say hello, Madam President. Thank you. See you again soon. Thanks. <laughs>